All right, so tonight I'm going to be preaching a little bit different sermon on a Sunday night. We're going to be teaching just kind of a real a, a doctrine. It's not a topical sermon. You know, sometimes I teach topics just on things that are going on in the world. You know, last week I taught on racism and some other things. Other, you know, on Wednesday nights we do our expository preaching. We just stick to one book of the Bible and just kind of go through verse by verse. Tonight I'm going to teach on a doctrine. The doctrine I'm teaching on tonight is the fact that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell for three days and three nights between the time that he was crucified on the cross to the time he rose again from the dead. Now, this is, I believe, an important doctrine. This is something that a lot of people have different thoughts and opinions on. But what I tried to do in outlining the sermon tonight, I'm going to try to answer every objection that someone who believes something different might possibly have. There's a lot of different, um, th and I think you'll find out, I, hopefully you'll see as clearly as I do about this subject, that the, uh, some of the other teachings out there really rely on a lot of acrobatics and, and, and not as much just letting the Bible teach you for what it says. It's really propping up something that they want to believe for one reason or another. And I'm not saying people have necessarily bad intentions when they teach something different, but let's look at the Bible and let it be our guide and let it be what teaches us what is true and what's not true. We just approach this subject and say, okay, well, what does the Bible say? We started off in Jonah chapter number 2. Because we see here, everyone should know the story of Jonah and the whale, right? The, the, he's running, Jonah's running away from God, and there's this big storm and stuff, and they cast Jonah overboard, and God had prepared this great fish, this big whale, to come and swallow him up. And Jonah spent three days and three nights in the, the belly of that whale. And in Jonah chapter 2, this is when he's inside of the, the, the whale's belly. So what we're going to see here, because... Jonah is a prophet. Because this is in the Word of God, we are going to see prophecies of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when you look at some of these verses here, it goes back and forth between Jonah literally being in the whale's belly and then these descriptions of hell. So let's look here in um, verse number 2. He says, and said, and, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And then he continues on in the next verse, number three, it says, For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. So now, he's saying, out of the belly of hell cried I, and then he's going back and forth from being like in the sea, and the, you know, and the waters being around him, and later it talks about, you know, like seaweed being kind of wrapped around his head, and all this other stuff. As, and then it says in verse six, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. So everywhere he looked, the earth with her bars he said, was about me forever. In every direction, everywhere around. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. And again, being a reference to the bottomless pit being in hell there. Now, the reason why I even bring this up is because in Matthew chapter 12, you could turn there if you'd like, we're going to see Jesus Christ... You know, when the people were asking him, and the Pharisees were saying, you know, you need to give us a sign, you need to give us a sign, when he's on this earth and he's preaching and, and you know, claiming to be the Son of God. He answers them in Matthew chapter 12, in verse number 39, and he refers back to Jonah, which is why we started off in Jonah, because if Jesus is referring back to Jonah, let's look at that, at, at what he's referring to. Right. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, the Bible reads, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Now, was Jonah in the whale's belly for three days and three nights? According to Jesus Christ, he was. Now, is, did Jesus lie? Did Jesus know all things? Yeah, of course. So when Jonah was, was speaking here in chapter 2, and he's talking about being in hell, was Jonah in hell? No. He was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. But he was a prophet. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, because we're going to see this also in Acts chapter 2. There's many prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament where, 
For example, Psalms is a great example. There's lots of prophecy and there's lots of foreshadowing of Jesus Christ to come where it is the Word of God. David may be speaking it or penning it down, but it is God's words that he is penning down and he's not, you know, oftentimes you can read through it and you could see he's not talking about himself here even though he may be using the first person. Just as Jonah was using the first person. He's saying, you know, out of the belly of hell cried I. But it wasn't him that was literally in hell because he was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. And Jesus is saying, just like he was there, the Son of Man is going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, where is the heart of the earth? I mean, the heart of anything. If you're in an artichoke heart, where are you going to go to? Right to the middle, right? You've got to cut all the way through to the center. The core of the earth, right? Anything that's in the center of your heart, I mean, is generally in the, in the middle of your, your chest or of your body, right? That's where a heart of something is. So he's in the heart of the earth. He's not just six feet under the surface. Right. Right? If you want to get to the heart of the apple, you're going to get all the way down to the core, to the seeds. Right? You're not going to just peel the top layer off and say, oh, yep, there's the heart when you just get underneath the skin. So to say that Jesus Christ, you know, for him to say he's going to be in the heart of the earth, obviously he's not referring to his body that was put in a tomb. Right. That is not the heart of the earth. You cannot, nobody, I, I'm sorry, I will not accept that argument. <laughs> it's just completely false to say that that's what he was referring to, just his dead body. No, his soul went for three days and three nights to the heart of the earth. And there's another false argument, we're going to deal with that a little bit later. But you're in Acts chapter 2, because I'm starting off, I just want you to see the clear teaching from the Bible before I go and start answering the other objections, the other teachings where people bring up to this. If you could just see this, you know, Jesus referenced Jonah, Jonah himself reference being in hell right his, the, the earth with his bars was about me forever and um, crying out of hell Acts chapter 2 is even more clear than that look at verse number 22 Acts chapter 2 verse 22 the Bible reads ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So here Peter is explaining, he's preaching unto the men of Israel, and he's saying, look, you know, this Jesus of Nazareth, he was approved by God, but you wickedly took him, you crucified him, but he rose again from the dead. He's explaining the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as he's explaining this, let's continue down in verse 25, he's going to reference Psalm 16. He's going to reference the Old Testament. Verse 25 says, For David speaketh concerning him. Right. And this is where he starts to quote, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So he's quoting directly from Psalm 16. And you know, write that down if you want to look that up later and you can see the, the correlation here between Acts 2, verses 25 through 28, and Psalm 16. He, he's quoting it there. That's exactly what he's, what he's referring to. And now he's going to explain this passage. He started off saying, well, Jesus Christ, you took him, you killed him, you crucified him, but he, res he rose again from the dead three days later. And now he's going to go in depth further to say, see, look at the scripture here. Look at Psalm 16. This is what he's saying. And now he's going to expound on Psalm 16 in verse number 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's seeing this before 
spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Because what he was quoting there, of course, look at verse 27, he says, because I will not leave my soul in hell. What he's explaining is, that's not David saying that his soul was going to be in hell. David's not the one worrying about that. He said, no, David knew that he was already promised of the Lord that of his seed, that physically descended from his seed, was a Christ was going to rise up, which is exactly what happened. That's why Jesus was called son of David in many places, because he physically was descended from David the king. Now, he's explaining here perfectly that, look, he knew all of this before, and he's describing the resurrection. When Jesus Christ was dead, when he was crucified and dead and buried, his soul was not left in hell. So in order for his soul to be left in hell, it had to be in hell. He said, God, you didn't leave my soul there. He actually came back up from the grave, from the dead, from hell. His soul resurrected from the dead at his resurrection. He was speaking and referring to the resurrection that his soul was not left in hell. And let me tell you this, the word hell in the Bible, do your own word study. It is never, ever, ever a positive reference, a positive place. You look at descriptions of hell, it's fire, it's brimstone, it's torture, it's torment. You cannot show me one place where the word hell is used to describe a place that's really just not that bad. Because the doctrine goes, turn if you would now to, um, to Luke 16. The doctrine goes, the fault, one of the false doctrines goes, well, when Jesus died and when he said he went to hell, he was, he was in the heart of the earth. And, but it was this special compartment of hell. It was a special place where he didn't actually suffer. It wasn't any of this fire, or torture, torture. You cannot show me that in the Bible. You cannot show me that this place exists in the Bible. And the one place that they'll turn to is Luke chapter 16. While you're turning, I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 10. Ephesians 4 verse 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he, ha he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He's saying, well, what does he mean? I, we know that he ascended, he, he, he rose up and, and ascended up into heaven, but what is it except that first... He descended into the lower parts of the earth. He did that first. It says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And in Romans 10, verse 6 says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? And being the deep, he's like, well, you know, Christ is the only one that fulfills all these things. So it ascends up to heaven and that went down to hell. Now, let's look. We're going to read this passage here in Luke chapter 16. It's a story about a rich man and Lazarus and what people will refer to as a place called Abraham's bosom. This is the first false assertion that people will make that I think is completely false. We've already seen, I think, extremely clear in Acts chapter 2, Jesus' statement about being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and Jonah chapter 2. It's pretty clear what the Bible's showing us there, that Jesus Christ went to hell. Right. And you have to do a lot of dancing around the subject to try to make it say anything different than that. Luke chapter 16, we're going to start reading in verse 19. We're going to read all the way through this and then I'm going to expound on it a little bit more. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, 
so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, you know, just a brief summary of this story. You've got a rich man and you've got Lazarus. Lazarus is poor. He's a beggar. You know, he dies. And the Bible says he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Again, the surface meaning of that, if he's carried to Abraham's bosom, Abraham's a real person. Right. We know who Abraham is. He's referred to all throughout the Bible. He's like one of the main patriarchs that God made covenants with and promises to and is referred to all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. Abraham's a key player in the Bible. Abraham's bosom. Does anyone not know what a bosom is? Like on a body part? Like on your chest? So like, when I embrace my wife, when I give her a hug, that's my bosom that, that, that I'm embracing her with. So, and, and what is this even talking about? The, the response to the, um, to the rich man, because the rich man ends up in hell. He lifts up his eyes and he's just burning in hell like immediately. I mean, he dies and all of a sudden he says he lifted up his eyes and he's in hell in torments, in flames. And when, it, when he's answered, oh, why is this verse not, um, oh, verse number 25, it says, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Lazarus went through a lot of hard times in his life because he was poor, the dogs were licking his sores, you know, he's begging for crumbs. But then he's comforted by Abraham in his bosom. He's really close to Abraham now. He's got someone there patting him on the back and saying, well, you know, you're here now. Things are going to be a lot better. It's a comfort. And now the rich man's being tormented. So it only makes sense that even in the story, just saying that he's in Abraham's bosom, it's because he's being comforted. It's not because this is some special, magical place that's called, that has a sign over it that says Abraham's bosom. And like, hey, we're going to this place now. It's called Abraham's bosom. Yeah, I know it's a body part. Don't worry about that. Don't let that throw you off. It's just like this place that we're going to. And everybody that's all standing, all of these Old Testament believers of all time that have ever been saved, we're all hanging out here at Abraham's bosom. Now, I know, look, it sounds funny, and it should, because they won't present it to you like I just did, of course, but... You have to stop and think. That is what they're referring to. They're referring to this place because they call it Abraham because they don't want to call it hell because they want to separate the, you know, the hell part, the fire and the damnation, which is talked about everywhere in the Bible. Even in this passage, he was in hell. But what they say is, well, see, look, it says here that... Um, when Abraham told him, and beside all this in verse 26, between us and you there's this great gulf fixed. He's, and they're saying, well, I mean, they could see each other and they were talking to each other, so it had to be just, just you know, they were right there next to each other. Well, first of all, if they were right there next to each other, I mean, how far does someone have to be before you can't really even have a conversation with them? Not that far. Would you call that a great gulf? Like, I mean, just someone just out of range. And, and get someone as far as you can go and actually have this type of a conversation with that person. Go as far away as you possibly can. Do you, would, would that constitute a great gulf? I don't believe so. I, I mean, you, 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 I don't even think you go across the street and have like this type of a conversation with somebody. Let alone someone who's in hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and people you know, crying out for torment. This 
is obviously a miraculous event. This is not something that has just been going on where, yeah, people in Abraham's bosom, they've always just been having conversations with people in hell. This is in the Bible for a reason. I believe this may have happened, but it's miraculously happening. This is something that God is allowing to happen to teach something to us in the Word of God. That is why it's here. And there's lots to be learned from this, but we're not going to get into all the things we learned from the story. I just want to point out that, you know, it's foolishness to think that, you know, because they think that just because they could see each other, well, look, it's miraculous either way. So whether it's up in heaven and in hell, why could, would that be any different from being, you know, a great gulf fixed somewhere in the heart of the earth? Either way, it's a miraculous event. So, you know, to use that to, well, they could see each other. Well, no, they would have to be separated far, I mean, far enough away from the, from the burning fire, and you know, in order for that to somehow physically make sense. This is not some, some physical thing to, to really get anyways. This is obviously a spiritual event that's taking place here, and it's a miracle. So to say that, oh, well, he's in this, this special place, no. He is in a special place. It's called heaven. Abraham was there. And he met Abraham, and, he's, and, he's, and that's why the angels carried him to heaven. And we have other examples of angels taking people to heaven as well. I don't, we don't see anywhere of angels taking people down to the heart of the earth. Right. There is, that doesn't exist. Right. Unless you want to say that that's what they're doing here, but that's pretty much a stretch because it doesn't actually say that anywhere. Now, just as this story shows that a person either goes to heaven or hell immediately when they die, there's no soul sleep, there's no purgatory, there's no waiting around. I mean, this rich man, it says he, he lifted up his eyes. Basically, he just looked up. He's like, wow, I'm in hell from when he died. And the same thing with, with, uh, with Lazarus. He was carried up by the angels into heaven, and he's just there. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So while we're here and, and we're in our bodies on this earth, we are absent. We are separated from God. Because God is in heaven. He says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Teaching that, well, as soon as our soul, our spirit departs from this body, we're going to be present with the Lord. That is, that is the, the teaching there. It's, there's nothing in between. We're not waiting around, hanging out in purgatory. You know, getting, you know, purgatory is a purging. That's where the word comes from. It's, it's, it's an extra purging of your sins because the Catholics don't believe that what Christ did is sufficient. Right. Which is why you need to be, go through further purging. No, the purging comes when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and He has purged me and washed me of all of my sins. He is sufficient. What He did is enough. That's it. That's where salvation lies. There is no such place called purgatory. It's never found in the Bible. You're in 1 Samuel 28, because here's another argument that I've heard people try to make. This is when Saul went to the witch for advice on, on, on the, the, the battle with the Philistines. And he needed, you know, he was trying to get a hold of God, and God wasn't answering him because he was wicked and, and he was not right with God at all. And God was just like, I'm not talking to you, I'm done. But he wanted so bad, he, so he went to a witch and tried to get to talk to Samuel, which actually miraculously ended up happening. Now, when we're, as we're looking at this, because the narrator of the Bible, see, you're going to find things in the Bible where people can say things, especially like in the book of Job, but doesn't make it always true or right. It means, you know, when the Bible's recording what somebody says, they actually said that. Right. So it's true. It's found in the Bible. I mean, the Bible records things that the devil says, but it doesn't mean that what he's saying is the truth. Right? It just means that he actually said that. So when we're looking at this story with the witch and stuff, you can say, oh, okay, well, do we want to trust this story because there's this witch and everything else? Well, if the witch is speaking, you can doubt what is actually happening based on just her words. But when the narrator of the Bible, the, you know, the, the, the third person that's, that's conveying the story that's not the witch, it's not Saul, it's not any of these people, it's just the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, the Word of God, then we know that what it's saying is true. We, I mean, we have to be able to say that that's true. And what it says here, look at verse number 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 28. 
Then said the woman, this is the witch, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. Now, a lot of people say right off the bat, see, look, they're talking about bringing up and who should I bring up? See, so the direction is you're bringing somebody up. Now, that doesn't have to mean that all of their souls and everybody is, is in hell or in the lower parts of the earth because they're using a terminology or a phrase that would be commonly associated with witchcraft of bringing somebody up. I think that's just, I mean, I've always read this and always believed that they're, they're talking about witchcraft stuff. I mean, bringing up a spirit doesn't necessarily have to mean it, it's, it's see what they're saying because they're literally in hell and they're coming up from the, no. But let's keep reading. Verse number 12. And when the woman saw Samuel, so she did see Samuel because this is the narrator giving this story here. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice and the woman spake to Saul saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. For what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. See again, now this is what she's saying. I saw God's ascending out of the earth. Did she see God's? God's? No. I mean, I mean, well, it depends on what you defer, de determine, you know, yeah. talk to be a God, right. right? Is it a devil? Yeah, maybe she did see some devils coming up. Right. But it's not like whatever her view of what a God is, right? It's not like these idols or these false gods. Maybe it was, she did, I'm sure she saw something, but her description of it may not be necessarily accurate. So we're not going to hold that to be, um, you know, either here or there. But look at verse 14. It says, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped down with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And this is again verse 15 now, the, the narrator saying, And Samuel said to Saul. So he's literally talking to Samuel here even though Samuel had already passed on. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So the whole argument that I've heard from this is just the fact that they're using this phrase, brought up. Why hast thou called me up? Well, I could use the same phrase when someone calls me on the telephone. Why did you call me up? I'm not ascending out of even anywhere. I mean, it's not a, a directional thing that, that I'm going. It's just a usage, you know, it's just a common usage of, of, of language. And what we can see, though, as far as direction goes, Ecclesiastes 3.21, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter 3, all the way near the end of the Bible. Ecclesiastes 3.21, again, in the Old Testament says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So if we're talking about directions of, of where spirits go, we have one verse right there that's saying the spirit of man goes upward. So to say that all, you know, Samuel, Saul, and everyone else in the Old Testament all went down, it's pretty weak. Not convincing at all from that first Samuel 28, but I want to bring it up because I've heard people use that before. And you, you decide for yourself whether you think that's a real strong argument or not. And see, this is what I mean is because when I've talked to people about this that, that believe in this, they'll try to jump around and say, well, what about this and what about this? And they think they have this great mountain of evidence right. because they'll go to Abraham's bosom and then they'll say, well, what about first Samuel 28 and what about this? And the only way you could try to put it together, you have to, you have to prop it all up and say, see, there's this. And, and, and if, I, if, if you were not hearing from Acts chapter 2, if you were not hearing from Jonah and from Matthew chapter 12, and someone was just trying to teach you this doctrine, they could easily turn to Luke 16 and 1 Samuel 28 and, and, and these other places we're going to turn to to try to prop up what they're trying to, to, to teach. But I'm going to them all tonight just to show you that none of these none of these can stand on their own at all. They're not very credible at all. The only way you could try to use them to support something is if you already have the preconceived idea that there is this special compartment of hell that is not really burning in torture and torment. It's the only way that you can do it. 1 Peter chapter 3. So, because here's another, another argument. People say, well, what about Jesus preaching to the souls in prison? What about that? Because they'll say that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the whole reason why he went to hell was just to preach. He didn't go there to be suffered or tortured or anything like that. He just went there to preach to the souls in prison. And they'll use this one verse as their justification for that, as that was the reason why he went. Well, let's take a look at it and see what it says. 1 Peter chapter 3, 
We'll start reading in verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So did Jesus preach unto the spirits in prison? Yes. Does that say the spirits in hell? No. It says the spirits in prison. Okay, but let's keep reading. Which sometime were disobedient, when once... The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, when we, when we actually look at this carefully, we try, because I'll be honest with you, you know, the way that it's written, it kind of is a little bit confusing. What is this actually talking about? And I know for a while I was just confused, but I didn't know what this verse meant. I never thought he was talking about, like, you know, what, what people are claiming with, with Jesus going to hell and, and stuff like that. But when you hear that and you get that spin on it, you could start to read it and just automatically assume that that's what it's talking about. But we ought to be careful just to read it and take it for what it says at face value. And without even expounding on everything that this passage is talking about, let's just see when this event is taking place because it gives us that information in the Scripture. So, in verse 18... It ends with, but quickened by the Spirit. So Jesus Christ, he was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also, by what? By the Spirit. He went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. So these spirits that are in prison were sometimes disobedient. When? When were they disobedient? When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. This is talking about all the way back in the, in the days of Noah when, when Jesus was preaching to the spirits in prison. And again, it doesn't say hell. It doesn't say any of that stuff. So, and it doesn't tell you that this happened when Jesus was during the three days and three nights of his, of his death, burial, and resurrection. It just says that um, Christ suffered for our sins the just for the unjust, there in verse 18, that he might bring us to God. So his suffering brings us to God. Why? Because we're sinners and we need his atoning blood, his, his, his payment to be made on our account for our sins, obviously. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So, again, I, I don't want to get too far into this whole chat because this is going to be a whole sermon in itself just in this one passage. But um, I don't think that this is still very clear enough to say, yes, this is referring to that specific time when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, that his soul was in hell. It's talking about spirits in prison. And again, you could look at people being referred to as spirits and, and, and um, not just having, not, not having to necessarily been deceased in order to preach unto, unto someone's spirit. You'd be in the spirit and, you know, whatever. But uh, let's go to the next, the next place. Um, turn, if you would, to yeah, go to Luke 23. Luke 23. Because this is one place that does, that does trip people up. And I could understand getting tripped up on this. Of all the references, I can see I can see where the confusion comes in here. Um, but when you when you compare all the scripture together and, and what the Bible is teaching and what it, what we've already seen clearly taught about Jesus Christ going to hell for three days and three nights, there's only one explanation for this in Luke chapter 23. Because people say, well, what about the thief on the cross and paradise? In Luke 23 verse 43. Jesus Christ said, it says, Jesus said unto him, talking to the thief, Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So this is the thief that repented, he, that he ended up, you know, at first he was casting, you know, all kinds of, of wickedness in his teeth against Jesus, just, you know, just like the other thief was. They were both kind of railing on him and, and mocking him, just like the soldiers were. And then later on he's like, well, wait a minute, you know, we're in this situation justly. And he kind of rebukes the other, you know, like, like, this guy didn't do anything wrong. He's just. And he ends up putting his faith in Christ. And Christ answers him. He's like, you know what? Because then he said, remember me, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom. You remember me. 
And that was his calling on Jesus for salvation. And Jesus answers him, you know, verily I say, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So, we've seen the verses that say Jesus Christ's soul went to hell for three days and three nights. We have to reconcile this. This is not something that you can just look past and just say, oh, you know, I don't know. And this is probably, like I said, this is the biggest um, evidence, I would say, at all for anyone who wants to say that Jesus didn't really suffer in hell or anything like that because of this one verse. Now, paradise, I don't think, you know, is always used positively. There's no negative reference to paradise. It's a good place to be. Um, you'd have to just be completely ignoramus to think otherwise. But, um, it, it, you know, it's definitely not talking about hell here. Right. We're saying being with me in paradise. Now, my explanation for this is that Jesus Christ is part of the Trinity. There's Jesus Christ, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Jesus Christ has all of the attributes of God. Now, he limited himself when he bodily came to this earth, but after he passed, I think the limitation was gone. He still was able to pay for our sins in hell. He still was able to go to hell and spend that time. So he said, I was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, while at the same time encompassing to be, you know, in heaven as part of God the Father to to have this make sense and be true. Say, today shalt thou be with me in paradise because if, when the thief dies and goes to heaven, he's going to be with God, which is part of the triune one God and one Lord that there is. So him saying, you know, when he says, I and my Father are one, and he's saying to this, you know, you're going to be with me, he's being with, with God um, while he's paying for that in hell. But, I mean, I could see, I could see where you could be a little bit confused with that. But when you look at how clear all the other passages are about Jesus Christ himself saying, you know, I need to go to the heart of the earth. The only, the, the way that they reconcile this is they'll say, well, paradise must have then been in the heart of the earth. Because that's the only way that you can try to reconcile the two where Jesus said, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth. And here he's saying, you're going to be with me in paradise. Well, then paradise must be in the heart of the earth. No. No. It's not. And, and, and actually the word paradise, it's only used three times in the Bible. There's three mentions of the word. This is one of them. The other one is in 2 Corinthians 12, 4. It says, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to hear. This is Apostle Paul talking about a man that he knew, and, and he was caught up into paradise. So here it gives the direction of paradise being up. And then in Revelation 2, 7, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Again, referring to the kingdom of heaven, being in heaven with God. So two references of the word paradise are definitely in heaven, and one of them doesn't give the location. But to think that it just means some other place doesn't make any sense. It's, 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 a, it's trying to fit a, you know, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole, whichever one, you probably fit the round one in a square hole. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, people say that believers, and see, this is the other thing that comes out of it then, is people say, well, believers were not allowed into heaven because Jesus had not died yet and actually paid for their sins so that nobody was ever allowed into heaven until that could take place. Turn, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 2. And you definitely need to see this. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. Because that statement is false. That is not taught in the Bible. It may sound good. Say, oh yeah, well we need Jesus to save us. Well, yes we do. But to say that you are not allowed entrance into heaven until in our time... That God has created time, that, that Jesus had to fulfill that like, like you know, 2,000 years ago in order for anyone who has died previously to gain entrance into heaven is false. First of all, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was slain from the foundation of the world. That was in, the, in the, you know, the prophecy for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God in flesh. Jesus Christ was perfect. Now, he did face the temptations and stuff, but he was still God and still was perfect. And he demonstrated it. But God is outside of time. I know that Jesus Christ bound himself with many limitations while he was on this earth. But it was already a, a, a foregone conclusion from the beginning 
of the world that this was going to happen and that it essentially did happen. I mean, God refers to things that, that, that um, are going to happen as though they already did happen. He refers to things in the future. I mean, it's, we already know in Revelation these things are going to come to pass. Like, like it's already written and done. Right. There is no other option. It, there's, it's not going to happen any other way than it says in the book of Revelation. Like That is set in stone. Right. The same way that Jesus Christ coming and, and dying on the cross and rising in from the dead and paying all the penalty for sin was already accomplished, if you will, even before he came to this earth and did it. But just to show you scripturally with the evidence, not just using logic, that... that People have already gone to heaven in the Old Testament. Before Jesus Christ died on the cross, it's written there in 2 Kings chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. With Elijah, it says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Look at verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. God took up Elijah and took him into heaven to be with him in heaven. Was Elijah a sinner? Yes. Absolutely he was a sinner. Of course he was. We're all sinners. Did Elijah not need the atoning blood of Jesus Christ for salvation? Yes, he did. Just like everybody else did, yet he still went to heaven prior to Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross and raising him from the dead. So to say that, well, no one could have gone into heaven because it's just false. Elijah already did, and Enoch did also, but this is just even a more clear example than Enoch, because Enoch was translated and God took him to be with him in heaven. I believe we also have evidence of believers in heaven in Job chapter 1. Now, and this gets into a whole other false doctrine of the sons of God and you know the, the angels and all this other stuff and Nephilim and all this other nonsense. And it is nonsense, but... Job 1, 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. All throughout the Bible, the, the term sons of God is always referred to as being believers. John 1 says, you know, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And all throughout the Bible, a child of God, sons of God, a son of God is a believer, someone who has Christ, someone who is in Christ, because Christ is the only begotten Son of God, and we are sons by adoption or through the power of Jesus Christ. We are a son of God. And the Bible says, Unto which of the angels at any time said he, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. God has never referred to an angel as his son, and he didn't refer to the angels as his son here in Job chapter 1. So again, we see another example here of sons of God, believers, in God's presence in heaven. And it says, and you know what? Satan also came among them, because Satan has a power to go between earth and heaven up to this day. He has not been cast out of heaven yet and completely kicked out that is what's going to, to, to start the great tribulation is when he is he's kicked out and he knows he has but a short time on this earth and then he's going to go and really wreak havoc and and uh, attack the believers now it only makes sense that jesus went to hell to pay for our sins since that is the punishment that is prescribed to those that do not accept Christ's payment, right? I mean, if you die in your sins, if you die without putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, where are you going? You're going to hell. Why? Because you've sinned. Why? Because that's God's punishment on your sins. That is what God has prescribed. So why wouldn't it, if Jesus came to pay our punishment, to pay for our sins, why would it only be required that he just get whipped and shed his blood or just be nailed to the cross. Other people have been nailed to the cross before, but that doesn't pay for their sins. Other people have been whipped and beat up and scourged and, and have all these other things happen to them, but that didn't cover their sins. In order for Jesus' atonement to be complete, he had to die on the cross. When it says he became sin for us, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God couldn't even look at him because he was bearing the sins of the whole world 
in his own body. He embodied our sins and took our sins with him to hell to suffer and to pay for those sins so that we can receive that pardon and that forgiveness because they have been paid for. Amen. Not because they've just been overlooked, but because they've been paid for. Amen. People also look to the, uh, the statement that Jesus made when he was on the cross when he said, it is finished. And I'll read that for you in John 19. It says, Now there was, a, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And people will teach that, well, when he said it is finished, that's all that had to be done. It is finished. And he did what needed to be done to pay for our sins. No. That was not what he meant by it is finished. It was not all done what he had to do. First of all, what about the resurrection? Yeah, didn't that have to happen first? I mean, in order to, to complete the whole process of, Jesus, of, of the gospel, of our salvation, the death, the burial, and the resurrection from the dead? I mean, the resurrection is, more, is, is, is emphasized way more than the death. I mean, who emphasizes the death? Again, I mean, the Catholic Church might, when they put up the hanging Jesus, the dead Jesus on the cross, we, re we, we recognize a resurrected Jesus, one that's, that's conquered death and hell, one that has the keys to death and hell because he came and he paid for those sins when he was there for those three days and those three nights. So just because he said it is finished doesn't mean that he didn't still have to go to hell and he didn't still have to rise again from the dead and complete all of the prophecies. What I believe that it means when he said it is finished, his earthly ministry was finished and his earthly fulfilling of prophecies was finished at that point because he said it right after he had received the vinegar. It says in John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It was timed for that one moment. The Bible puts together his reception of the vinegar with the statement, it is finished. Because that was the last prophecy that needed to be fulfilled before he could die on the cross. I mean, he was still staying alive on that cross to fulfill all of those prophecies. And he was going through, I mean, think about that. Like, he's got to be thinking, like, man, this is, you know, this part of this is finished. When he's, when he's up there on the cross, because he was agonizing and having, you know, he was being tortured extremely. I'm not going to get into all the details on the, the torture that crucifixion will, will give you <coughs> with the asphyxia asphyxiation and the, just the, the, the beating and everything else that he had received and hanging there and his, his limbs being out of joint and all the pain and everything he was going through. But... He was fulfilling this. The prophecy was found in Psalm 69, verse 21 says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, Matthew, and I've looked this up, Matthew gives an account of them giving him vinegar prior to this event. They had given him vinegar more than once while he was there, even before they crucified him. So you say, well, couldn't that be the fulfillment of Psalm 69? Why, why would it then have to be at this point? Well, the reason why I believe this is the, the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment, is because this is the only reference that uses them putting the vinegar on hyssop and putting it to his mouth. And the hyssop being used in John 19, when you look through, all throughout the Bible when hyssop is used, they use that in the painting of the blood on the doorpost at Passover. And Jesus was the Passover lamb. So the, the, it all fits together so immensely perfectly. And I can't even express it in words, but I can see everyone's getting what I'm talking about here with them using the hyssop to put the vinegar in his mouth, fulfilling Psalm 69, and at the same time fulfilling the putting the, 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 the blood over the doorpost as the Passover lamb is slain and offered up to pay once and for all the punishment for our sins. That's what he meant by it is finished. It was, I mean, he still needed to be raised again from the dead. That still needed to happen for the completion of the gospel, for the completion of, of the atonement of everything that he did. 
It does not mean that, that, well, it was all done and paid for then, which is why he didn't even have to go to hell. No, he did because he was bearing our sins. Because the Bible says that that's where he went. Because he was prophesied of in Jonah. He referenced that prophecy in Jonah. And in Acts chapter 2 and in Psalm 16 that was quoted and explained in the New Testament. You could say, oh, Psalm 16, you know, it's the Old Testament. It was explained in the New Testament of what it actually meant. It meant the resurrection of Christ. His soul was not left in hell. Hell is never a positive reference. So, you know, again, it only makes sense that he did that. Since our, the punishment for our sins would be held, Jesus came and paid that for us. It makes perfect crystal clear sense. Try not to let these people, and, and you know what, this is advice for any doctrine that you hear. When, when people are kind of, you know, you're looking at something, and you're like, okay, I could kind of see that. And then they're going from here and bouncing around. Make sure that every piece of evidence that used can stand on its own. And if it can't, then there is good other scripture that stands on its own. Because I'm not against using supporting scripture where it's, it's not quite as clear. But if your whole doctrine revolves around all of these not so clear statements, like not any one of those, none of the ones I mentioned, not in my mind at least, can really just stand on its own. I think the best evidence would have been when Jesus Christ said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise unto the thief on the cross. I think that's the, the most solid scriptural anything to say, you know, where you have to try to reconcile that with these three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But I think it is falsely, falsely um, reconciled that they just they didn't do a good job. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is not some strange doctrine. I think it's completely taught in the Bible. But um, try not to be deceived by the people that will tell you that, uh, that this did not take place. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching in Scripture. God, I pray that you please help us all to be good students of the Bible, that we could search the Scriptures and, and know whether the things that are taught are so. Dear Lord, I would pray that everyone in this church would... Do that with the things that I preach. I know that I'm not perfect, dear Lord. I try to only preach the things that I am dead sure about and that I know to be true, but I know that I could also make mistakes. And, and I pray that you please help us all to be diligent in our own studies, our own search, that anything that we come across or hear or read or, or hear in church or whatever, that we would be able to do our own due diligence to search it out and to make sure that what is being taught is truthful, dear Lord. And we pray for your guidance in this area and that you, in your wisdom from your word, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.